Hi, I'm Lady Balefire, and you're watching episode 6 review and of House of the Dragon, and today I am joined by Jed, the Hollywood Scholar. How are you doing today, Jed? I'm doing great. I'm so excited to sit down with a book expert such as yourself to talk about this episode. I have a lot of conflicting thoughts on it, so it'd be really nice to hatch it out with someone of expertise per se. So yeah, great to be here. Yeah, what's your relationship? Have you read the book like to the source material? Like, Are you familiar? Yeah. So I've read the main Fire and Ice books once a very long time ago, but I've never gotten around to Fire and Blood. I probably will once the show ends i don't want super big amounts of spoilers so i definitely plan on checking it out afterwards but at this point no i'm not familiar with this specific book okay so what are your thoughts about the show so far it's I definitely think it's getting overhyped to a certain extent. I do like parts of it. Like there's some pieces of dialogue that I think are great. And then there's a lot of other stuff that I think was lackluster, especially last week. I definitely think last week's episode five was the worst of the season so far. Just oh, yeah. a lot of repetitive dialogue that we didn't need and slow paced and just not, it was a lot of unnecessary stuff. This one, there's a lot of character breaking stuff and the dialogue yeah. was more relevant at least, but yeah, the character breaking stuff in this one really bothered me. So it's very conflicted. Overall, I have this series about a six out of 10 so far as an average, but that might change very rapidly with the changes coming to in the show's near future. Yeah, I think with me, I've kind of like, a lot of people are like, why don't you rate this higher compared to other stuff? And I've decided a long time ago, I'm not grading this on a curve. I'm not going to say that I'd like <laughs> this more because the crap is produced. I'm sick of getting crap from these studios, stuff that wouldn't mm -hmm. cut it in my own screenwriting classes. So <sighs> let's dig into it. So this episode starts with Rhaenyra giving birth to her third child we learn later. And I saw this as a preview from HBO and I'm just like, what the actual heck am I seeing? I think there is a huge um, issue with these feminist people or like writers, like men and women saying this where they want to kind of get the women's perspective. And this scene, along with the scene in um, Wheel of Prime, where like Tigrain is in labor and she's fighting like 50 guys, it just seems so unrealistic. Like, what did you think about this? Uh, this particular scene, I don't know enough about the actual childbirth mechanics let's yeah, say you don't know uh, enough to say either way right uh, from what you're saying about the wheel of time with them fighting during it that seems insane but in this one my bigger problem was with the performance of the actress it definitely seemed very bland like i didn't believe that she was actually in labor it's like oh why am i here she seemed bored more than anything yeah, else and that's a kind of staple thing is of her like, performance just to in give general. the audience to um, an idea of what's happening in the scene it's like She's at the end terms of labor, like the baby is just about to come out, it comes out, and immediately the queen wants to see the baby, so there's some logic problems in my head, like, labor takes a long time, how does the queen at this very moment mm -hmm. know to see the baby? And the other logic problem Great that point. I have is, if I had to describe Rhaenyra's character initially, I'd say she's a spoiled brat. And we learn later the reason why she wants to see the kid is there's some question of its paternity. And so I'm just like, is a spoiled brat character going to just say, okay, I just pushed this kid out of me, like, let's go walk down. And she hasn't even passed the afterbirth at this point. Like, she's like, get my dress. I mean, she eventually does as she's getting up. And I'm just like, <laughs> I'm a woman. I've had, like, insane menstrual pain. I don't think I could do that when I'm feeling at my worst and let alone having just given birth. Well, especially when she leaves the queen's chambers, they show her There's where like she just walked, and it's blood. covered in blood. I'm like, if you're losing that much blood as you're walking just that short distance, you're on like internal bleeding. Like you have a you have a problem. There's something punctured in there. Yeah, you need to have that. And that again, was too much. Yeah, again, like shout outs for Rhaenyra for beating the fifty fifty childbirth odds here. Yes, yeah, that's yeah. quite impressive. After three kids, yeah, she got 50 50 three times in a row. Yeah, that, that's and, quite impressive. Um, and it just advanced the video a little bit. And then we go through the thing with Allison. And I, I think, don't like this Allison. I, I prefer the other actress. Yeah, I did too. You know, I was interested in what you had to say with the characters and how you said that you liked the um, actor that they had for um, Lane or the Best. Mm -hmm. I actually agree with you. I think he's a good actor for this role. And I've always, my problem with this show is I've never figured out other than 
giving the message why they started the show where they started because really it, as, and you're writers so do you feel like there has been anything really important that has happened in the first five episodes that they couldn't incorporate into the story that's happening now uh there'd be a few things that would feel like a little forced and out of place like a lot of the daemon stuff like with the uh battle in the narrow sea i just don't know how much all that applies later on like yeah. of the i don't know what's essential for the next few episodes but I, I feel like we could lose a lot of it i think the best thing to come out of these initial episodes is viserys as a character and the way he's king so we get an inverse of what it's like once he's gone once that happens Besides that, I think that that's the key thing that they're trying to get across, but I don't think you needed five episodes to accomplish that. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at with that. And um, what were your thoughts on, like, the actors that they changed, or, like, just the time jumps, mm -hmm. too? Because it's supposed to be a 10-year time jump. I think the characters, like, um, mentioned yeah. that a few times. <laughs> they, yeah, they do mention 10 years. Uh, my biggest problem with the time jump is there's a few instances where there's necessary information cut out like uh specifically with vagar that's the one that pissed me off the most oh, is in goodness. episode one they set him up to be oh this is the biggest dragon the only one left from old valeria and no one can tame it and it's like a oh, super big deal it's like oh they're gonna set up like maybe damon has to uh catch it or whatever and then in this episode <laughs> it's like oh yeah um this random person we met once as a kid basically is suddenly riding vagar and he's yeah, like that's, i'm sorry what that's that set up with no my... payoff what the fuck moment and I, I wanted to see that yeah it's well first of all at the time in fire and blood he does happen where they offer lena to um the series in marriage and mm -hmm. her response at the time is no i'd be rather riding my dragon and her dragon has always been vagar and so when they're from they're giving the vagar story i'm like how the hell do you lose a dragon <laughs> like the biggest most powerful like uh-huh f15 kind of craft in this world and you've just lost it like it just flew away and what's worse mm -hmm. yet is that by week the time we get to this episode it's just rem remarkably like appeared and come back into the story right like, like if it was always with her that would be fine but they uh, they made this payoff or the setup they set it up so cool and then it's just like oh yeah there's no payoff why'd you expect it so there's a few minor instances of uh, similar issues like that, but that was the biggest one. And uh, yeah, another one. That was a really big my... logical lore break there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if it wasn't that way in the book, I don't know why they did that. But I, I was not a fan of the replacing the actors, especially because once you think about the age of the characters. Yeah. So at this point, uh, Rhaenyra is like 28 from what we learned from the last episode, 10 years plus yeah. that. You don't need an actor swap for that. That's what this I actress looks like... like she's 40. I know. She, she looks. I don't know if I'd say that old, but, like, the age jumps don't seem to be that much. Like, she, the actors that they had playing the girls in the earlier episodes, they looked really, really young. Like, I would expect mm -hmm. by, like, episode five, four or five, they would have changed the actors there. Mm -hmm. But, like, I, I didn't buy that at all. And the Rainier actor that they have, just, I don't think it looks like the original one mm. at all. No, I don't think so either. And I prefer, uh, what was it, Emily Alcott? I, yeah. I prefer her quite a bit to Darcy. Yeah, Darcy so I, I think they should have of... kept it. Yeah. Especially because they kept Sir Christian Cole, who's just a few years older. They kept a lot of these other younger yeah. actors who were roughly the same age. So I don't get why. It was very inconsistently or I applied. Think I, like, I think you said you like the younger actors. I could have bought it if they just started with the older actors too, because... Mm -hmm. It is is really weird because when I looked at Lily Alcock, like she she looks like really young. She looks like sixteen or something. Like by the time she gets married, it's like she's older than that. But that's not a huge deal. But we're up to the part where you had mentioned that you had some issues in your review of this, and this is a part where Rhaenyra is um, introducing her other sons to their new little brother, and with they have. Um, Sir Hare Strong, the father, and he's kind of carrying the kid around and looking at it because it's his kid. And how did you feel they handed that? And I know that you had some specific criticisms to the casting and what they did there. So I was wondering if you could talk a little about that. Yeah, so specifically the problem that this creates in a plot-based way is from the, the race swaps. Mm -hmm. In the last couple episodes, the race swaps haven't super affected anything. Like, they're still written well or as well as anybody else in the show. You can forgive it to say, hey, they went down south, they had some family uh, intermingling, and it 
it passed they down came the generations. From the Summer Isles or something like that. Yeah, exactly. That's kind yeah. of silly, but. I mean, it's you can at least attempt. Yeah, you can attempt to justify it. But once it's a plot related issue with heritage like this, it, it it's it's immersion breaking. It's yeah. making these characters out to be incredibly stupid. And it's made even worse when they show later on in the episode, Damon's children who have nearly exact same heritage. It's the yeah. brother or the, the sister of who's supposed to be the father here and the uncle of who's the mother here. Like they have nearly exactly the fam same family tree. So they have just as much likelihood of turning out closer to one race or the other. Yeah. And they're not mixed children. They have no white blood in their family. So like yeah. what was going on there? Like no one thought, oh, that might cause an issue. Oh, like at least well, in the books, from what I understand, Viserys had legitimate plausible deniability. Because yeah, that was my problem with it too, was that like, in the books, it's not obvious that they're necessarily bastards. The only thing is the hair color. Mm -hmm. And there was, like, you know, it wasn't so obvious that no one would believe her. I mean, there was some kind of plausible right. deniability. And what you said, too, is important because it's, like, if it's so obvious they're bastards, they're not going to be able to inherit. Yeah, and exactly. I don't think any of the characters were that stupid in the books. And it's just, it does break it, it because really they painful. just totally don't look like they could have even came from the same father at all and mm -hmm. it's just it makes it so it's like it's too obvious to me and that's why and, i didn't like it yeah yeah and and someone did point out in the comments of my video that they've seen it sometimes in uh, interracial marriages where some kids lean towards one race above the other and that makes sense but there's no leaning here yeah it, it's it's very much and it's also, an, uh, an, uh, an opportunity for or a, a situation where perception is reality type situation. So it's definitely plausible for the kids to lean one way more than the other. But everyone's going to see those kids and immediately assume. And that assumption is more the problem than the truth. Yeah. And the so the way I was looking at it was like, OK, if the kids came from Lenor and her, they'd be a quarter black. So you're going to end up with somebody that looks like Meghan Markle, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. But... Something like that. I mean, <laughs> So I'm just like, it, yeah, and this is like, there's no absolutely question. And Yeah. I, like day one, that first kid was born, the whole of King's Landing should have been uproar about it being a bastard. Yeah. but It should never have gotten this far. Yeah, it does, again, seem like it's just like they're just making the characters look kind of silly with this. So after that issue, and then she meets Allison, and we get the kind of, you can definitely see relations are um, deteriorating. And how do you like how they did, like, the Allison and Rhaenyra advanced relationship? I I feel like it wasn't quite justified to the extent it should have been. Like, yes, Allison has reason to dislike Rhaenyra at this point, but Rhaenyra doesn't have a reason. And that reason for Allison is a shallow one. That mm -hmm. is a pretty common one that wouldn't lead to, I'm going to be killing family now. Because it's just like, oh, you lied about losing your virginity. Yeah, that I... Can, that's me... something that happens. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it, it's I've never not liked the way opinion. that they did the relationship between the two of them because in the books, like Rhaenyra is nine years younger than Alicent, so they never really would have been mm. friends. And then, of course, they start in the first episode with this sort of like lesbian baiting, and mm -hmm. I just don't like it because it because I think with the age difference with the two characters that um you could get you would get more like the they would go into the mother or stepmother and like stepdaughter kind of relationship i think a little easier mm -hmm. and so the conflict would be more natural and if they were doing mm -hmm. the backstory you could kind of get the feeling that like it's really kind of weird and awkward for me to have a stepmother that's um just almost my same age yeah and that kind of would would that was she still underage at the point by our standards when she married Viserys if she's nine think years she older? I would have been so young as she was. Okay, the so they created some. So they created something stuff. that was, I think, initially just really weird, and it was very uh -huh. much like we hate the patriarchy kind of a thing, and you're just doing this because of the dad, and which is kind of true in the books. It's just that it's kind of like everything with the show. It's like yes, the secession problems were um revolved around like people's sex but like at the same time there were also a lot of other issues like the first issue was like between Viserys and Laenor from Rainey's was that Laenor was literally seven years old and Rainer was Rainey's was putting her claim aside for her son so it was a choice between the adult Viserys or the seven-year-old kid 
That's a little bit more clear cut than the show made it. Yeah, out to instead be. of like, well, they don't want me to be queen because I'm a woman. <laughs> oh, I, I did not like that like opening prologue of the first episode. It's like they didn't want Rainey's because she, she was a woman. Yeah, like, I mean, that's you gotta nice. justify that. Like, was she a better option? Was she more educated? Would she have been a better leader than yeah. Viserys? You can't just say because woman. You need to say, all right, she was more qualified, but he got it anyway. All right, but yeah. no, just saying. It, it just comes and across. And then we meet the shallow. kids of like um, Allison's kids, and you meet her son, like um, Aegon and um, Aemon and Helena. And I didn't like this, and you probably don't know this, and I stopped it here because this is a really like kind of it's like a member berry scene where she's looking, and I don't even know why she would be looking at this bug, but she's making comments about it and says that it has like one eye or something like that. And right, in the Amond. context of Amond, who loses his mm-hmm. eye later on, and I'm just like, so. Are they implying she's prophetic, or is just something that I happened? think it's like... just some really kind of heavy-handed um, mm. foreshadowing. They do this another time too. I think I can't. I have to look at my notes and find it when we get there. And um, yeah, I just. I just hate, I hate whenever, like, we're getting so many adaptations where any kind of information from the source material, it just becomes member berries. Like, Mm -hmm. I think we're seeing that in this show, we're seeing it in, like, Rings of Power, too, and it just makes me sad because it's, like, that should be the main thrust of the story. Same thing happened with the Witcher series, which is one that I care a lot about. It was, season two of the Witcher had no Witcher books in it, and it was just references. It was awful. So then we get this, and then we get this other. Come back to Viserys, and he's just doing awful, and. Yeah, he looked like Gollum to me. Yeah, he's looking really bad, and they're now, talking about the thing that happens with the kids, and. I, I do have a question about Viserys real fast, of sure. uh, book wise versus what the actors have come out and said. So the actor came out and said that he was suffering from leprosy. But that doesn't make sense to me because that's highly contagious, no, he and no did one not else have has it. In the book, like, okay. There's something that I really have an issue with, and um, they're more than willing to race swap out characters in these shows because they want to get diversity inclusion. But what actually happens to Viserys in the book is he's just a very like he likes the pleasure of life, and he gets really really fat. And he ends up having mm. a heart attack and dying. And yes, the That's Iron Throne does kind of like hurt him and towards the end of the reign. And they're using that as kind of a metaphor. And you can see by mm-hmm. now he's down an arm. And mm-hmm. the same thing happens to Rhaenyra. And I don't know what it is about these shows that are so like up with this diversity, equity, and inclusion. But they just will never put fat people in... T- into these shows and it's like it well, it, not in a negative light like that yeah, like, that would they definitely don't want be to do negative. that and i'm just like why it's like you change everything but when it comes to somebody that's overweight like that's just too much we can't possibly go there well a witcher <laughs> does that in season three there's going to be a 400 pound woman who is described in the books as um so beautiful it would make gods and nymphs jealous <laughs> Yeah, and then this was another, like, um, unintentionally, like, I don't think they meant to do this, but there, um, Allison comes and talks to Viserys, and in this point, like, he's comparing, like, what happened, oh, well, I had a black stallion, like, come and breed my white mare, and it had a mm-hmm. chestnut-colored foal, and I'm just like, so black people are horses now. <laughs> and it's kind of like... <laughs> Wheel of Time, like, Wheel of Prime did the yeah. same thing where it was like they were trying to be inclusive with these gay warders and then one of them was like, I don't want to bond to this woman because her warders are already gay and that's not for me and he kills himself. So they unintentionally do something in the right. name of being inclusive and well, I was just like... Well, what stereotype do horses and black people have in common? I think they were going for oh something God, like that. Oh my God, I didn't even freaking realize that. That's horrible. It's even worse when you think about it. Some Mr. Hand stuff going on. I mean, like, I think you mentioned this, too, about why um, George R. R. Martin didn't want to race swap this particular mm-hmm. family. And I was wondering if you could tell us some more about that, because I think I, I liked right. I thought it was a good point that you brought up. 
Right, so this is all third hand information. So I don't know if this is actually true, but uh, I heard that in the books, at least the Valarians weren't dragon riders. No. And because of that, they were considered second class citizens in uh, old Valyria. Yes. And then descended still second class citizens. And George thought about making them black originally in the books, but he decided not to because he didn't want to portray black people as second class citizens. Yeah. And so the show decided to do it anyway and then give them dragons to make up for that, which kind of destroys why yeah, the Valarians and the Targaryens yeah. are so opposed to each other. Like narratively that has import. Yeah, like I wouldn't say I, I agree with all the first part, but like when they do get dragons, it's because Rainey's has a dragon and then because she's a um Targaryen, like her children have dragons. Mm, her too. children get it. And okay. I think there was a weird thing in the story with like like at the I think it was the end of the first or second episode when like Damon is talking to Corliss and he's talking about like we were never dragon riders and it's just they don't say it outright, but there's the implication that we are second class citizens and we don't have dragons because okay. and then you just see it on screen. So I think anyone in water and like that's living in this climate would say that and I just hate that. Mm -hmm. I just it, it's counterproductive to whatever narrative they're trying to push and that comes across a lot in these types of uh, agenda yeah. first situations yeah so then we have the Alicent situation and we're talking about the stallion was as silver as the moon on a winter's night and the foal when it was born it was chestnut okay and then you can kind of see things are falling apart between them and then she talks to Kristen Cole and we see like the relationship developing between her and Cole which is important <laughs> Yeah. And of the characters who evolved over that 10 year period, I think Christian Coles is the one that makes the most sense. Like I got enough before the time yeah. jump to understand why he got to this point. Everybody else who changed, it's just like, oh, you're not even close to the same character. Yeah, with him. that was another there's thing I meant some... to ask you is like as a writer, when you do change characters, or there's time jump or something like I was think feeling like these weren't the same characters that were in the beginning of the story. Like they're not acting. They're like out of character. Mm -hmm. Like I think you'd say in writing. How did that feel well, for you? Like, did you? Was well, in a lot of different ways from even decisions they make. Like, Rhaenyra's whole deal is she doesn't want to have children. She doesn't want to just be the baby maker of the family. And then mm -hmm. suddenly she's got three kids. Yeah. And she's totally chill with it. And, like, uh, you got to show that evolution to the moment she makes that decision. And Allison, she is a completely different character and partially stems from like the showrunners wanting her to be a tr Trumpian woman apparently yeah, I was that like, they, the they was threw that? development out the window. They It's just like she's generic evil woman who's mad all the time now. Whereas before there was at least something more to her character previously. I mean one thing that this show really doesn't get and I think this is because of the time jump thing is that part of the um, appeal of the original Game of Thrones was that it was a political intrigue. It was the plotting. It was smart characters doing like machinating so to say <laughs> making evil plans and carrying them out and this show is really lacking that and i don't know i think it's the oh, time yeah. i think it's because they're they they want to give a certain message and mm -hmm. i missed that but this episode did have more of that at the end which is i think good mm -hmm. But. Well, I, I think a, a big problem with what you're talking about is the political intrigue is they have these conversations too readily and too freely with each yeah, other Yeah, exactly like like these are conversations you want to do behind closed doors with someone that you trust, not just randomly. We're yeah. like a, the Strongs were talking about his son being the father of the children. Out in the where open. Rhaenyra could just hear it's like, what if a servant walked up that same staircase? Like you, you got to be smarter and than see, that. And we see so many people in that same hallway again. So it's a really dumb place to have a conversation. And mm -hmm. one of the things I wish they would have done earlier is establish who Larry's clubfoot um, Strong was because you just don't know and it's so easy you, he's kind of like the varies and little finger kind of um, yeah. master of whispers character yeah and i just thought like I, I just think of so much of this show as missed opportunities like imagine mm -hmm. being able to show him as this master of whispers and he's talking to like servants and that's a way you could convey information about what's going on without having the characters have to tell the audience through made and butler mm -hmm. dialogue but we don't know that, so I'm wondering, like, as a non-book reader, did you, like, kind of figure out what was going on with Larry's, or...? 
Yeah, I, I was told to keep an eye on him back in episode two, I believe it was. Yeah. Maybe it was three when they were hunting the stag. Like when he sat down and was listening yeah. to everyone, someone pointed him out to pay attention to him. So I kind of was paying attention yeah. enough. And I, I got what he was going to do with his brother and father. Uh, I saw that coming. Yeah, His character is actually the one I think is written the best. Yeah, like he too. has some really good pieces of dialogue. The, the one that I feel in that family that is the biggest missed opportunity is his brother because suddenly he's in love with Rhaenyra and yeah. there's that great wholesome relationship I, i'm like have them talk once before the time jump five. oh my god that was so bad when he's talking to Rhaenyra on the ship the dialogue is awful and he just goes from being like let's run away together to like oh nope nope my duty is the most important thing i gotta keep my good name yeah no, and uh, the only time that um the strong uh, the older strong brother interacts with her near before the time jump is when he pulls her out of the mob that's not an, it's like oh yeah uh, he, he touched her butt there so they're in love now it's like i know sorry i'm gonna need more than other, that they see each other like on their little like orgy date with damon they see each other in the like alleyway <laughs> yeah there's zero character development with them which makes it kind of hard to believe i mean mm-hmm yeah, and it comes across as, like, it's a wholesome, normal relationship. And it's like, you're going to have to set that up with these types of characters yeah, who aren't healthy because, in any way. Yeah, um, Hare Strong is not in the Kingsguard. He's in. The, he's a captain of the City Watch. And so that doesn't make any sense for him to be hanging around mm -hmm. the castle, like, so much that he is. But <sighs> moving right along, we get this. Now, does this, uh, um, does this scene remind you of any scenes in Game of Thrones? Uh, Tommen. Yeah. Suicide. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting decision they made. This scene was yeah. bothering to me for a different reason, though. N like, nudity doesn't usually bother me, but yeah. the two big nude scenes in these series so far has been with Matt Smith, the first one that bothered me, because that's the doctor. I don't want to see him naked. And then this guy, he's the son of David Tennant, the 10th doctor. Oh. And I don't want to think about, like, I saw him in the behind the scenes as a little kid running around with Georgia Tennant and him, and it's just like... That's weird. Uh, that's You're really a little weird. kid. See, I hated this because I'm like, what What reason is there for this scene to exist? What information are we giving oh, the we audience don't, that couldn't happen? That's something done teenage better. boys do. That's something that I can see actually happening. It's unnecessary, but it's completely plausible that I it know, actually I know. I just happened. wonder if there was a more creative and um, maybe less explicit way they could have done this scene. Because this is just so like... It made me kind of uncomfortable watching it. I don't know how old this person is. And it's just kind of a squick for me. And I'm just like, mm -hmm. I, I really hate how this show has this, like, we're going to give the women's perspective. And so instead of getting the weird, awkward, like, female sex scenes, we just get a bunch of weird, awkward male stuff and stuff that's just... Just out balanced. Yeah. Like, I don't... I mean, I think they could just get rid of this kind of stuff and I'd be good with it. But it's, they feel like they have to do I, it. I think, I think that... If they were trying to justify the scene, I think they're trying to say they put him in a position of vulnerability with his mom walking in on him before she drops yeah. the load on him, for lack of a better term, about Rhaenyra wanting to kill him. But that's yeah. not enough justification. But I think that's probably what they would say. Yeah, and I'm just kind of like, I think of something like American Pie. I mean, think mm -hmm. about it, it's the same scene and it's just kind mm -hmm. of like, oh my god, it's funny. And you know what's going on even if you don't see anything like that yeah and then it's also exactly the tom and seed so it's like what kind of a juxtaposition are we doing here children falling from great heights yeah i don't i don't know what the like and uh, that's weird and so after this scene is we get some dragon oh, i got so excited when i saw this moment because i figured Me out too. it was vagar from right away yeah. and before we saw her we saw damon flying up behind him it was like oh is he gonna try to like take Vagar as his mount we're gonna get this yeah. cool action scene where he's like I will claim this roaming dragon and then yeah. she's just riding him like oh, I'm sorry that must not be Vagar then I'm um, all right whatever but it is yeah. I cannot do this very fast yeah it's Vagar and, and it's like I was thought oh cool dragons this is so rad and I knew who it was because it's he's so old and stuff but or she's mm -hmm. old but I you know, I, have I like that his thought, hair is long. Again. I know, I love that his hair is long too, but I've always said that it's like the minute you they cut his hair, all I could think of is Doctor Who, and I said this last week, mm -hmm. but when you have an 
actor that is has such an iconic role it's really important to make the audience not think of them in the role and i think the hair did it with damon and he is an amazing Mm -hmm. actor so Mm -hmm. i when they cut his hair i'm just like he looks like a really bad doctor who with weird hair that's all i could Mm -hmm. see when that but i was yeah i like this scene because of dragons i was like oh this is so cool but at the same time it's like i think this was one of the worst cg scenes the show has had so far like the yeah, the dragon CG has never impressed me on this show. Like the faces really feel off on the dragon's faces. Yeah, Even from episode one, so, I was saying that. Yeah, I mean the the one in the dragon pit earlier looked really good. I think because it was dark, but mm-hmm. I mean, uh, judging from where they where they shot this and stuff, it's like I would as a filmmaker try to get like a clear sky just because when you have the clouds like this, it makes the lighting sources so difficult to do. And I've seen people mm-hmm. when they do this stuff, and I'm just like, it, it just disappointed me for that reason. Because this was like, eh, it looks really weird. Like back, like this part right here by the wing and stuff. That just was like really weird. Yeah. And then also they're like in Pentos. And why is there no town there? I don't understand. Why are they in Pentos? Why are they in a relationship? We saw them dance once kind of before walking away. Yeah. Like they did, were how not really how was that for you not knowing the backstory? So jarring. It's like, oh, this child who was too young to marry the king is suddenly married to his brother halfway around the world with no setup for their relationship, no setup for why they left. And it, it does like Damon he needs to have a good reason to leave and apparently in the books he he does. And like I, it's just a lot of setup that was missed in the time jump. And yeah, Damon and what, as my favorite character, yeah. I needed that. I know, it's like everyone likes Damon and I hated the earlier episodes because it had Damon baiting titles, like you're gonna think it's gonna be about Damon. But the that Rogue really Prince high. and he wasn't in it. <laughs> that pissed me off too. I know, and I hate this too because I think I mentioned last week with um Mike was that like the last episode we got the first really like loving relationship between two people and it was like Lenor and Joffrey Lonmouth and it was a gay relationship mm-hmm. and then the when um Damon marries Lena they actually were really happy and they had a really good relationship and so I I when I watched the after episode commentary a lot of people were like we don't watch that stuff but I saw that and I just I skipped last week's but I know I'm yeah gonna watch but him. like this is like they're they're talking about how this is a breakdown of their relationship and they're unhappy. And then again, you do what they do. What so they do so often in this show is that they, um, the unhappy family relationships always revolve like with the children. Like she's pregnant in the scene Mm -hmm. and you know, she's married. They have kids. She's unhappy. Like I I see a lot of Her unhappiness is what led to her suicide. Like they said, that was the dumbest thing that they said. And I will get up to the suicide part, but it's just, it's just sad that every time they have a, like a canon happy relationship, they're like, no, Mm -hmm. we can't have this. Family is awful. Children are awful. And they just hate that. And I'm so tired of seeing that. (laughs) <laughs> we need some positivity to invest us in this world yeah. like game of thrones people loved how like anyone could die at any time it was dark no characters were free of pain but there were still like the ned starks that you're like all right he yeah. is a genuinely good person that and, makes it worth the fight yeah and just think of like the way that they show strong female characters i mean look at catelyn stark i mean look what she does mm-hmm. to save bran and then even somebody like Daenerys, uh, the, the kind of feelings that she has with the child that she lost, like, it's just, it's heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. And, but their idea of femininity is to have women acting like men in the story. And <laughs> I had to say this is weird, and maybe you could see this as too, but when I was thinking of this, I I try to think as a writer creating a world, and your, your main thesis is that this is a patriarchy and that women can't get ahead no matter what. So I'm first thinking in my head, if that's the world the women live in, wouldn't it make more sense for women to start working the system and trying to Mm -hmm. play that? So you have with the Cersei's and stuff like that. But at the same time, it doesn't work because they have the men giving the message to, like Damon says several times to Rhaenyra, Like, oh, you know, you're going to have to get married and have kids and that's so dangerous and stuff like that. And and I'm like, like, and and Lainor's like, yeah, I got stabbed with a a lance once, but I still wouldn't want to be a woman. It's like getting stabbed, getting uh, giving birth. I don't know who could compare those. Just don't compare them because yeah, I mean, you don't know (laughs) if your world is the patriarchy. Does it make sense to have men? 
like delivering the feminist message of mm -hmm. women shouldn't they be the one that are oppressing the women you think you think but yeah we don't think of that stuff so the big exciting thing and this is what like made me like this episode probably more than i would have without it is we have the show down between Kristen cole her swift and um the sons of allison and rhaenyra and i thought this was the best part of the episode i would agree yeah definitely because this is where Kristen cole really got a chance to shine uh there was decent choreography that made sense from a character perspective and these boys they acted like boys like as a kid i know yeah. a lot of people who acted the same way so it's the one that felt the most organic yeah. natural and did the most for a lot of these characters and did the most for strong because in most of the episode, he's just standing there listening to people talk to him. But this one, he was an active participant in the scene. Yeah, and it's really that, his only one. Yeah, this was a good scene. And I'm just actually going, I'm not afraid to give praise where praise is due. And it's good <laughs> because we don't need any kind of exposition. They are able to communicate the relationship between these um, two, like Team Rhaenyra and Team Alicent here. By mm -hmm. how the characters interact with each other, the dialogue is believable and good. The action, like you mm -hmm. said, is well done, and the fight choreography makes sense. And through the action and through the conflict established by the characters, we immediately know what the larger, like, thematic things that are going on and the larger, like, um, conflicts between the characters. So we get a lot of information through this. This is a very mm -hmm. good example of tell um, showing and not telling. Right. It does actually does create an issue for me, though, as well with the last episode in the fact that Christian Cole is just a king's guard. He's not a king consort royal member. Yeah. And so he, he gets his face beat in very similar to how a long mouth did in the last episode. Nothing happens to him. He barely gets hit a few times in this one. And the yeah. captain, of the, uh, the city watch has to leave. It's that bad. Like those aren't equatable punishments yeah, for equatable crime. Yeah, that's something crime. I had a problem with, and it also reminded me of how Oberyn Martell dies. Oberyn Martell is mm -hmm. one of my favorite characters in Game of yeah. Thrones, and I was just like, can you just do right. something original? And, and and the explanation I heard from people is, oh, Allison protected uh, Kristen Cole from getting any in any trouble from the last episode. I'm like, uh, the heir to the throne is in love with this man. She can protect him just as much as the queen can, so yeah, I, I, I just don't get what the... in in uh not equal I just displacement thought, of punishment i just thought that the way that they did that like, christian cole and lawn with teen was just awful because what happens in the book and it and i've said this in last review is that he kills him in a tournament and they've already established in the show even that you can do something like that in a tournament and it's totally socially acceptable mm -hmm. and it actually would yeah, be even up. more meaningful for his character because he's doing it in front of an audience so immediately mm -hmm. the people are going to be like look at this guy just like brutally like killed this guy in combat and it's like they know like they know who's on team rainira and who's on team mm -hmm. Alicent. so it actually makes all the characters look better instead of making mm -hmm. Right. Christian it Cole does sound like a, a lot better. A simp and then uh, the fight tele teleported. They were at the back of the Great Hall and suddenly they're at they're the, in middle the middle far end. And then of course they have like Lenor's um exclamation which just makes me like really mad for another reason that comes out in this um episode but we'll get to that in a little bit. And then of course we talk about the strongs and how they're going to leave and oh, she God. hears this and this was more like traditional Game of Thrones right here where she's going around and she's hearing things in corridors. This is kind of like what I wish they would have done earlier in the show. But... And uh, Lionel, he's a character that I'm very conflicted on, especially because of this scene. He seems like the best position for the Hand of the King. Like, he seems like he's intelligent and doing things for the right reason. Yeah. But he's also so bland and uninteresting that it's like, I want Otto back. At least he was in, like really smart and manipulating people and interesting to watch yeah i like uh, yeah. Otto. i mean i don't the, that's another problem with this and maybe we can talk about this as writers for a second is they're so invested in this idea of that we shouldn't have like a hero character there isn't there everyone's bad like we all mm -hmm. this is just grim dark stuff like do you think that works 
Uh, to a certain extent, I think it can in certain universes. This one definitely has the best argument for that. But even in Game of Thrones, there's always those characters who lean more towards being classic heroes. Like Jon Snow. Yeah. I mean, he makes hard decisions, but he's still a traditional hero through it all. Yeah. And he learns that from Ned Stark, who was it, that character early on. That there's still this central figure that people who want a good black and white can attach to. But the people who want gray storylines, yeah. they can attach to those ones as well. So there's variety for the most broad audience possible yeah. and this one i'm not rooting for team black or team green it's, i don't I know care i'm like for wins. the dragons and they're going to get hurt so bad in the story but that's just something i i mean i think with this kind of especially with tv it's something like you need somebody to root for and i just don't feel like i care about any of these characters because mm -hmm. they're all like so bad and self-centered yeah and, so, and Rhaenyra they're trying to make her out to be this feminist icon and it's like no she would be a terrible ruler she would yeah. be awful she's selfish self-centered she's not all that intelligent like allison had a good comeback for why didn't we take the yeah. stepstones and have a militia there and like i i would not want this woman as my queen and that has nothing to do with her gender is yeah, I, I would be afraid i mean the reality in the book is that she is just somebody that is very like indecisive she's very self-centered she's kind of like a spoiled brat and she always has been mm-hmm but then they can't get the message through. So this scene that comes back is when Lena comes back and he has a new boyfriend and I just I don't I don't like how they're dealing with Lena in the show because I don't think it mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mesh with how they've established the depiction of homosexuality in the show and I don't mind that it exists and I think it's there and he's definitely gay in canon but it's like they, these guys are so out there like it's so out in the open it doesn't it doesn't make sense to yeah. me, especially because in this episode when Larry's goes to the prison and we'll get there eventually, but um he talks about how somebody is there for like degeneracy. So I'm assuming mm -hmm. it could be something like that. So if somebody if people are in yeah, a prison for could. that, like is he just gonna be traipsing around here with his boy toy? Yeah, he's not straight passing. Um uh, my issue with the scene was with Rhaenyra though, because she had some definite uh toxic ma uh, masculine traits where it's like uh, like the patriarchy it was a matriarchy. She's like, Oh, is it the scene where she's like, No, I order you to stay. Yeah, she's like, and it's I like that's what you hate it. Yeah, it's like, that's yeah. what you hated to be treated like. Why don't you have a little, like, uh, treat others as you wish to be treated if you want to be this feminist icon that people want you to be? It just yeah. makes her incredibly unlikable. She's like, yeah, Lenor, get the hell out of there with your boyfriend and go fight. Just get away from this woman. Yeah, I did it. I just hate that. Like, and it just drives me crazy because it's like, you don't have to do that kind of stuff to make a character likable. You don't have to cut down all of the grass so that your one character is the only piece of grass standing. You can stand on the shoulders of other people to achieve greatness. And they don't do that. It's like you don't you don't get anything out of making other people look bad. That doesn't nope. make your character look good. That just makes them look like selfish jerks. So then again, exactly. we are back with the Valerians and... Um, and this kind of goes back to our Vagar conversation. There's some inconsistencies here with... So, from what we know about her age, they said she was 12 in the one episode, four yeah. years later, then 10 years later. So, she's about 26. And she says yeah. the first time she got a dragon when she was 15. Yeah. But that wasn't Vagar. So, did she have a dragon die and then she got Vagar? I don't know. I just think they made a mistake there because she was 12 when she was first offered at Viserys and she was already writing Vagar in the book. So I think they just were like, who cares? What's the lore? Who... Yeah, so then yeah. we get back. Oh, God, this this part. And it's where she she's in the council and then her breasts start leaking, which is totally understandable. But yeah, I just don't like understand like. It just seems to me like they are forcing her to be involved with this when she's still trying to recover. It just, it seems a little contrived to me. And it doesn't look like she cares. Like, this is what she wants. She wants to be a political figurehead. But this yeah. whole time, she's like, I don't want to be here. It's like, are you a political? Like, this is another example of her just not going to be a good ruler if she's disinterested in the normal runnings of the kingdom. Yeah. And then giving awful advice when she does yeah. decide to tune in. Yeah, and then, I mean, I mean, some of the stuff she says isn't bad, like, oh, somebody in that area would know, which is probably true, but it's like, this is also the person that thought that being in these council meetings was like a diss because she's the princess and she's the heir, so she should not have to do this or something like that, even though it was like a 
kind of an analogy to what happened to Jon Snow when they're like, you're going to be the Lord Commander's steward so you can basically mm -hmm. learn how to do yeah. the job, but they never make exactly. that. Exactly. No, and yeah, she was complaining about yeah being the cupbearer. And yeah. like, that's the perfect place for a kid to be. Know, if but... you're going to be the heir, that's where I would put my heir if they were a kid. Yeah. But they didn't even um, mention it. I, yeah. I wanted a line from Viserys. He was like, I've been planning on you taking, you or my heir by necessity. And I wanted you to be the best heir possible. So I've been training you. And yeah. just like shut down her, her it's like when we talk whiny about nature. The Brandon Sanderson lectures where they're talking about, okay, this is like characters have like likability, like competence and proactivity. And they have problems giving characters this. It's like, I would think maybe she would start off as thinking it was a diss, then maybe some mentor character like has, explains to mm -hmm. her, you know, you're in the best place to learn stuff. And as she goes through the earlier episodes, she's starting to learn how to play the game. And I always mm -hmm. compare her to Sansa. It's like Sansa is just totally clueless when she first comes to King's Landing. But through time, she starts learning how court works. She learns how to, like, mm -hmm. you know, pay attention, see what's going on. And... Ah, I missed Just that. Listening is the best education. And uh, an interesting point that this is the case for other, like the real medieval, I don't know if it's the case for Westeros, but a cupbearer position was also a near exclusively male position. So yeah. he was already showing his daughter deference by allowing her to be the cupbearer to begin with. So that should have been her clear sign. Hey, he actually doesn't care about my gender. He wants me to be the best I can be. Yeah. But that's... they don't even mention that either. Yeah, and then we get, oh goodness, and I'm always going to make a, a note of this. Um, I don't know if you've noticed the actual horrible murals that they have in the show. And we see them. In uh, the, I've noticed them in the Allison's room, but nowhere else. Yeah, they're actually in the hallways, like in the outside hallways where everyone stops. <laughs> so they're just and everywhere. Up the stairs, and I'm like, why? This why is orgies gross. everywhere? Like battle scenes, that makes sense. But why orgies? I just orgies? don't understand. It doesn't make sense for the Red Keep. It's like nobody showing the core. Is this licentious? And it's just gross. And I'm well, kind of sick and of And so this. many of them have... Yeah, so many of them and have vows really, of like, purity. They're very, very um, like erotic murals versus like heroic mm -hmm. Greek nudity or something like that. Yeah, this yeah is that like would be fun. This is like people engaged in coitus. Like, it's so gross. It doesn't make sense, and so many people here have virginity oaths, yeah. and it, it does, and they're not shown it's, as a overly erotic keep. Like yeah. there's not actual orgies going on everywhere. They seem more sophisticated than that, yeah. so it just feels really out of place. Yeah, and then we have like we're starting to see some cracks with Allison's support of Viserys and Lionel um, Strong saying he's going to resign, but he doesn't, and he ends up going to Harrenhal. And let's get to the part about Lena, because that oh, is... Oh, the moment he said he was going to Heron Hall, I knew he wasn't coming back. Yeah, you just that know. That's, like, that's not good. And then they have, this is a good scene here, to, um, where Larry's is mm -hmm. kind of establishing his character. And... Yeah. yeah, and especially after this scene, I knew who was going to be killing him, too. Yeah. But, like, this one, I really liked the dialogue, and I got a lot about his character. And this one, like, subtly gave us what happened yeah. in those 10 years like we, we it feels organic that these two have developed a relationship over yeah, the last 10 years where they left off that, if they did more scenes like this it would be so cool and mm -hmm. i don't know why they picked the sigil for this guy to be that like b probably because there's a character called beesbury that ends up getting yeeted mm -hmm. like early on in this conflict so i thought it was weird to give larry's that kind of a symbol mm -hmm. they could have done anything but that but well, and it doesn't make any sense. This is kind of like the whole uh, Mark of Sauron being stupid deal. Is if yeah. the marks on his cane, why would he give it to his henchmen that have yeah, their exactly. tongues cut out so they can't reveal anything? Like you got your super duper spies that can't say anything, but you give them pins that lead right back to you. Yeah, it's are you, again, I think are, that are you modern, dumber than we thought? Yeah, the modern filmmakers don't trust the audience. They don't think we're smart enough to make the connection, so they're making it for us. I hate that. That was. Yeah, that was a, that was way over the top. That like when they showed it later on that they're wearing the pins. Like yeah. otherwise, it's like oh yeah, you want criminals who have nothing to lose, who uh, they obviously aren't the type of people who know how to read or write, cut out their tongues, and they are the perfect spy master. And also give them master. like the <laughs> pins that yeah. Yeah, that's when it was like, all right, you're you're not as smart as we thought you were. Yeah, and then this is a part where they do mention that one of the guys is a degenerate in there. But then he has mm -hmm. somehow been the death penalty, which I they don't really elaborate on that. But I'm just saying, like, you know, maybe that the whole Laner situation isn't as acceptable as everyone wants to think it is. But 
we already talked about that. So uh, here we go. <laughs> and we have uh, this, this situation. This pissed me off so much. This made I me hate so this. angry too. I hate this scene. I hate this so much. You know, I wanted to do rage video about everything in this episode, but I didn't because I just don't find myself caring that much about any of these people. Mm. But this yeah, scene, that's yeah, have at it first. <laughs> All right, perfect. Well, I, as soon as the scene started, I kind of knew it was going to go. They wanted to make a mirror between the Emma situation, which doesn't make sense because Damon wasn't really involved in that. Or they didn't, at least they could have tied it in with like the air for a day bit with the child, like making the same decision, the same thing happening, and he gets some sympathy for his brother. But they don't go that direction at all. And so there's no reason to mirror those scenes whatsoever beyond the, oh, you got a 50 50 chance. And or like, no, a man is going to decide what happens to his mm -hmm. wife. That's and Damon doesn't actually make a decision, so that's not saying what you think it. They think it's saying, but and then like the head midwife guy comes over and is like, "Yeah, uh, gives him the same offer. Like, yeah, it, we can't get the baby out. The mom is dead. We can try to save the baby through C-section, but that's like our only option. It's the baby. A baby might have a shot, or they're both dead. Kind of situation. That's a no-brainer. Yeah. That's uh, that's one option. I know, and the, I love the, how it's always for these in these people's mind. It's always a decision the father has to make. And I said this with Pips the very first time I watched this episode. How much more impactful will the Emma death scene been if it would have been a decision they both made? And Emma very courageously said, "Save the child," and then they give the yes. child to the series, and the it's child dies. Emotional. Now, just yeah. so people know what happens in the books. She actually gives birth to the child, and this is kind of important for this story and kind of establishes that despite what the TV show says, the Valerians are actually blood of the dragon. She has one of those deformed kind of incest mm -hmm. dragon babies that doesn't survive, and then she knows she's dying, and Damon is very upset about this, and she just wants to go ride her dragon one more time because she loves flying, so she, like, starts walking out, and by the time she gets to the door... She actually dies and before she can get to the dragon. And it is really sad because Damon is upset That's so and much he's more holding her. Compelling. Yes, oh, it is. He tears her out. That's gold. Like, I'm okay with adaptations going away from the source material as long as it's of commiserate value. They took this gold and it. turned it into crap. This like, is like, imagine... I'm not going to die in fucking childbirth because I'm a dragon rider. I'm going to die like a dragon rider. So she goes up to the dragon and commands the dragon to kill her with dragon's fire. And that is so stupid. Well, it's she like, kills the baby. I she know, straight up, it's like, so oh, much. if I'm going to die, then screw this kid. <laughs> I just, like, it would have been so beautiful if she's, like, she's dying just like you're saying. The baby is already gone. She whispers to Damon. He's like, don't let me go out like this. And he knows her well enough to... I want to see the dragon to... one more time. Take well, me out to see the dragon. I... It's like, show that these people care about each other. Yeah. Show that marriage is yeah. more than just a burden and child bearing mm -hmm. is a death sentence. I'm so right. sick of it in this show. Well, I, I think it would have done really good for their character if she just said, like, hey, don't let me die like this. But he knows her well enough to know what she actually wants. And then, like, he has to carry her out to the dragon. And I think it would have been a little bit better if she'd been able to fly. And then, like, he had to burn her afterwards. Like, that moment of just yeah. him looking across at her dragon and see the life leave her eyes, but she's still smiling. Like, that's yeah. emotionally compelling. Versus, oh, uh, you know, the baby might live, but you're dead either way. Well, well, screw that i'm going outside to burn us both and how did she waddle in the middle of labor past all those thing. midwives like, uh, midwives somebody, guards damon who's somebody doctor? in that situation where you're like your baby is stuck in breach or whatever it's like you would have been laboring for hours you're not gonna have the strength to do that I'm just so sick. And it's women who are doing this. Every episode, it's got, like, some women writer, a women director, and it's like, we have to show you what women are. I'm starting to think these people don't actually know. They're so anti-family. I'm like, do they even have kids? Do they even know what it's like? I doubt it. I mean, the same thing with uh, Rhaenyra just dripping blood as she walked. Like. Yeah, it's just, it's so silly. And it's like, the, you know, if, if kids are the important thing that they want people to have in this world, then why risk the baby by immediately going for a walk or something like that? Like, it's silly. Yeah. And it, what made this even worse, like, if she was portrayed to be a morally corrupt character, all right, cool, she makes a morally uh, reprehensible decision. 
cool. She, she That's justified. But she's betrayed as a morally upright person in these last two episodes, especially as a good person. So it's contradictory. And Damon does a lot in that scene, though. His reaction to her death is compelling. Yeah, I have to and I think Matt Smith, for being a really good character and be able to carry <laughs> off this, like, kind of bad scene. We'll just leave it at that. He's He has been... <laughs> It's been, like, a great to see him in this role because I didn't know him from Doctor Who. I know him from watching The Crown mm. and some other movies that he's mm. been in. So I knew that he he's would do well great. for this character, even though I don't <laughs> think he physically looks like Damon, but that's okay. He sold me on it. Oh, you need to watch Last Night in Soho. That's his best movie. Not his best show, but his best movie. Yeah, I think I've seen that. But anyway, so we get the next epi- the next reveal, and this is a part where Rhaenyra is talking to... Um, father of her children and i think this is where what you were talking about comes to play because it's like so obvious that the kids are questioning their own paternity and i have to say with the kids that's not going to be good because they're going to say things and if it's obvious enough to a nine-year-old it's obvious enough to everyone else everyone that this isn't even like and it kind of reminded me, I want to say it was like an I, Claudius or something, like one of those Roman historical novels where there was like mm-hmm. some someone's wife where she would like get pregnant with her husband's child and then she would screw around. So this didn't happen. Right. Yeah, that's smart, at least. And it, this is also beyond the fact that we see Damon's children as well. It's also destroyed by a major plot point of season one of Game of Thrones being yeah. Ned going through the hair colors and like, oh, yeah. the, the Baratheons are always dark haired, but he's blonde. It's like the hair color was enough for perception to override yeah, reality. Exactly. They've already like established something that people could see in the universe and they're just breaking mm-hmm. the lore to suit the agenda. And then we have them finally deciding to go to Dragonstone, and she's like, bring your boyfriend because we're going to need all the swords we should get. Okay. Uh, There's plenty of sword fighting going on, but I don't think it's going to be helpful. Yeah, not the kind of swords you're looking for. And then this is such a boring kind of part of the episode, and then we get this part where they're going to Harrenhal, and then the fire and everything, and you see what ends up happening to these guys. This fire doesn't make any sense to me. Why are, why is the Lord of Heron Hall have a door to his son's bedroom? Why did the fire break out just there and then he seems to be fine and then the whole castle's gone? Like the logistics of it. Yeah, seem... the way that they kind of stage right. it was really weird. Like I think that his dad was sleeping and he was trying to get into his dad's bedroom and I don't know why the door wouldn't open. I mean Heron Hall does have <sighs> the kind of curse where they're like everyone's like bad things mm-hmm. happen in Heron Hall. So it's, I mean, that's a kind of established, and I didn't think they even talk about it in the show, but, um, like the causality of how the fire happened and like what exactly happened. And I guess it like eventually like it falls on him, but yeah, yeah. Weird. For, for characters, I like what it does for, um, there's so many V names, Flores, the, the brother, but like the logistics of it don't make sense. So character yeah. wise, it's good. Logistics yeah. wise, some problems. And then they, um. Oh, for Larry's the brother. Yeah, it sounds just like yeah, uh, fairies, <laughs> which is kind of funny, which is like everyone's like, where's Mushroom? And I think really like this is GRM, like having the characters that were in Game of Thrones, but he's kind of known for doing like kind of mirror characters and he does yeah, this with like Brienne. But the dwarf Maris. was too much. Yeah, but mm-hmm. like Mushroom is obviously Tyrion and that fairies mm-hmm. is Larry's and I don't know. It's cool. It's well, and uh, Mushroom... Nose. I, I heard that a big problem with Mushroom is he has some certain scenes in the book that wouldn't sail on Twitter, like with uh, Rainier teaching her how to do certain things. Yeah, he says that. I don't that, think that would end up well. that's one of the things well. where I'm just like, it's pretty obvious that probably didn't happen, but it just kind of adds verisimilitude to the books. And I have a big mm-hmm. issue with people saying, well, it's a, it's an inconsistent narrator. And I'm like, no, it's like any other historical work you would go and adapt into a biography or a biopic. Like, I mean, like when they're making The Crown or Bohemian Rhapsody, I'm really sure they ran into the same problem where they were contradictory sources. Yeah, that happens all the time. Lives. So that's why the that's a fun thing of reading this book is because it's in the book, too. But like... The people in the show try to think, oh, we can just get everything together and not pick a lane on any of these sources and just kind of show, like, our indecision as writers will mirror, like, whatever's going on in the book. And a lot of people say that that's why the show isn't as good as it could be because the source material isn't mm-hmm. good. I think that's a cop-out as a writer. I don't know if you feel that, too, yeah. uh, as a writer. <laughs> it definitely feels like a cop-out, but from what I've heard, Fire and Blood is definitely the weakest of yeah, it is. all the books, so that's already they're already on the back foot, if that's true. 
Yeah, and so. then the episode ends with this great. I liked. I liked this scene a lot because mm-hmm. of the kind of. Um, this is a really good example of them um, raising the stakes for the characters. They've done a mm-hmm. good job with Larry's and um, Allison's relationship, and I think this is really good because. I, I, well, there's kind of a problem with this because I don't think if she's like if she's telling Eamon that he or um, Aegon, her eldest son, that he is going mm-hmm. to Rhaenyra is going to kill him because he's the obvious heir because he has a dick. Um, I don't think she's going to be as upset as she is here that he has like killed his family members to bring her father back into the king's life. But yeah. I do like that uh, they they did like how they did it and how it played out. I just didn't think it quite worked with her character that they've established so far. What did you think? Yeah, well, I definitely some. I'd be interested to see how they, how Allison deals with the fallout of this and how she really feels versus the immediate emotional reaction. But I loved how he felt intimidating. Like of yeah. the villains so far, this is the first one. I'm like, ooh, he's an interesting villain who feels like he's a good mental opponent to all these people. Yeah, I like really like that Like, the crab too. feeder, I hated the crab feeder. That, he, he was, was so like underused. He was like a comic book, like, super villain yeah. kind of cheese ball. I don't know what they were doing but with that. This, but... but this guy, he he seems in vastly intelligent, intimidating. Even the his allies are afraid of him at this point. Like, he, he's the only, like classic game of thrones character that yeah, I feel is he's in the show like he's the one who is, feels this like this is the kind of stuff that made game of thrones such a good show and i hope mm-hmm. they do more of that mm-hmm. yeah so i could see him in seasons one through four of game of thrones like Definitely. he's the one character like you could plop him in there with everybody else he and he'd fit perfectly. the other people not so much they die like within a couple hours <laughs> yeah so um what would you rate this um episode out overall well, uh, I definitely feel like I'm being a little bit ge- uh, generous to the show, slightly grading on a curve like you were mentioning, but I feel like 6 out of 10 is reasonably fair for this one. There was enough that I liked, especially the dialogue yeah. in several instances that gave it that little extra oomph. Overall, just th- the weakest parts of these episodes have been when it's boring, mm-hmm. but this is the first episode also inversely that made me angry at a certain point with the whole... Yeah, me too. Uh, the, the baby situation at the end so it, it's kind of a very mixed bag for me yeah, it's I nowhere think, near my least favorite but yeah, nowhere near my I'll favorite it it's very because, middle of the road yeah they did like the good dialogue they brought some back why we liked game of thrones but it also had the message and we hate families and babies and childbirth mm-hmm. thing again so and then there was like when they weren't fighting and stuff that was boring so i'm like I'm, it's like a five i was actually mm-hmm. not like so bored as i was before so i'm giving it a five yeah. so the last week's was hard. Yeah, that was hard. Oh. I was like, what? And I'd been really generous to the show before then. Like, three and four, I genuinely enjoyed quite a bit. But yeah. last week nearly killed it for me. I was nearly done. Yeah. Like, the time jump with that being so precarious after that episode is like, yeah, I, I don't care enough. But Yeah, I hope that it gets better because despite what mm-hmm. everyone says, I actually love the source material. I want this to succeed. But, mm-hmm. you know, we see what you know, it's got you know, the message in it and people mm-hmm. doing things that they sacrificing um, the story for the scenes that they want to include. And that's a problem. But we're at the end of our review. So is there anything you would like to plug for your channel? Well, you can find me at Hollywood Scholar on YouTube. I put out daily videos, commentary on news, reviews of film and television, just stuff like that, and the occasional live stream. So if you're interested in that, definitely check me out, Hollywood Scholar on YouTube. Yeah, and we just did a really fun writing round table. So that is on his channel as well. So make sure that you check that out. It's really fun because despite all the stuff that we that makes us so sad about modern um, media right now, we're trying to create something better and put and put what we want to see out in the world. So check that out and Absolutely. come and see us next week for review of episode seven. And we're getting closer to the end. And I will see everyone next week. And thank you again, Jed. This was awesome talking to you. Of course. Oh, so glad to be here. Had a great time. Thank you.